The disciple said to the master, Master, how may I come to the supersensual life so that I may see God and hear God speak? The master answered, When you can throw yourself into that, where no creature dwells, if only for a moment, then you will hear God speak. Is that place where no creature dwells near at hand, or is it far off? It is in you, and if you can for a time, Cease from all your own thinking and willing. Then you will hear the unspeakable words of God. How can I hear God speak when I stand still from thinking and willing? When you stand still from the thinking of self and the willing of self, when both your intellect and will are quiet and passive, to the expressions of the eternal word and spirit. And when your soul is winged up and above that which is temporal, the outward senses and the imagination being locked up by holy abstraction, then the eternal hearing, seeing, and speaking will be revealed in you. And so God hears and sees through you, being now the organ of God's Spirit. And so God speaks in you and whispers to your spirit, And your spirit hears God's voice. Blessed are you, therefore, if you can stand still from self-thinking and self-willing and can stop the wheel of your imagination and senses. And thus you may arrive at length to see the great salvation of God being made capable of all manner of divine sensations and heavenly communications. Since it is nothing but your own hearing and willing that hinder you, so that you do not see and hear God. With what shall I hear and see God? since God is above nature and creature. When you are quiet and silent, then you are as God was before nature and creature. You are what God then was. You are that from which God made your nature and creature. Then you hear and see 
with that by which God itself saw and heard in you. Even before your own willing or your own seeing began, What now hinders or keeps me back so that I cannot come to that wherewith God is to be seen and heard? Your own willing, hearing and seeing keep you back from it. and hinder you from coming to the supersensual state. And it is because you strive against that, out of which you yourself are descended and derived, that you separate yourself with your own willing, from God's willing, and with your own seeing, from God's seeing, In your own seeing, you see in your own willing only, and with your own understanding, you understand in and according to your own willing, which is derived from the divine will. Your willing, moreover, stops your hearing and makes you deaf towards God. through your own thinking upon terrestrial things and your attending to that which is outside you. And so it brings you into a ground where you are laid hold on and captivated in nature. And having brought you here, it overshadows you with that which you will. It binds you with your own chains and it keeps you in your own dark prison which you make for yourself so that you cannot go out thence or come to that state which is supernatural and supersensual. But since I am in nature and bound with my own chains and by my own natural will, be so kind as to tell me how I may come through nature into the supersensual and supernatural ground without destroying nature. Three things are requisite in order to do this. The first is, you must surrender up your will to God and must sink yourself down to the dust in God's mercy. The second is, you must hate your own will and forbear from doing that to which your own will drives you. The third is, you must bow your soul under the cross, heartily submitting yourself to it, 
that you may be able to bear the temptations of nature and creature. And if you do thus, God will speak into you and will bring your surrendered will into God itself, in the supernatural ground. And then you shall hear what the Lord speaks in you. This is a hard saying, Master, for I must forsake the world and my life too if I should do thus. Be not discouraged at this. If you forsake the world, then you come into that out of which the world is made. And if you lose your life, then your life is in that, for whose sake you forsake it. Your life is in God, from whence it came into the body. And as you come to have your own power, faint and weak and dying, the power of God will then work in you and through you. Nevertheless, as God has created humans in and for the natural life, to rule over all creatures on earth and to be a lord over all things in this world. It seems not to be at all unreasonable that humans should therefore possess this world and things therein for their own. If you rule over all creatures outwardly, there cannot be much in that. But if you have a mind to possess all things and to be a lord indeed over all things in this world, there is quite another method to be taken by you. Pray, how is that? And what method must I take to arrive at this sovereignty? You must learn to distinguish well between the thing and that which only is an image thereof, between that sovereignty which is substantial and in the inward ground or nature, and that which is imaginary and in an outward form or semblance, between that which is properly angelical and that which is no more than bestial. If you rule now over the creatures externally only, and not from the right internal ground of the renewed nature, then your will and ruling is verily in a bestial kind or manner, and yours is at best but a sort of imaginary and transitory government, being void of that which is substantial and permanent which you are to desire and press after. Thus, by your outwardly lording it over the creatures, 
it is most easy for you to lose the substance and the reality. While you have nothing remaining but the image or shadow only of your first and original lordship, wherein you are made capable to be again invested, if you are wise, then take your investiture from the Supreme Lord in the right course and manner. Whereas, by your willing and ruling thus after a bestial manner, you bring also your desire into a bestial essence, by which means you become infected and captivated therein, and get with it a bestial nature and condition of life. But if you shall have put off the bestial and feral nature, and if you have left the imaginary life and quitted the low-imaged condition of it, then you are come into the super-imaginal consciousness and into the intellectual life, which is a state of living above images, figures and shadows. And so you rule over all creatures, being reunited with your original, in that very ground or source, out of which they were and are created. And henceforth, nothing on earth can hurt you. For you are like all things, and nothing is unlike you. O oh, loving Master, Pray teach me how I may come the shortest way to be like unto all things. Just think on the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said, Except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is no shorter way than this. Neither can there be a better way found. Verily Jesus says unto you, Unless you turn and become as a child, hanging upon him for all things, you shall not see the kingdom of God. Do this, and nothing shall hurt you, for you shall be in friendship with all things, as you depend on the author and fountain of them all, and become like God by such dependence, and by the union of your will with God's will. But mark what I have further to say, and do not be startled at it. Though it may seem hard for you at first to conceive, 
If you will be like all things, you must forsake all things. You must turn your desire away from them all and not desire or hanker after any of them. You must not extend your will to possess that for your own or as your own, which is something, whatsoever that something be. For as soon as ever you take something into your desire and receive it into you for your own, or in propriety, then this very something of whatever nature it is, is the same with yourself. And this works with you in your will. And you are thence bound to protect it and to take care of it, even as of your own being. But if you receive no thing into your desire, then you are free from all things and rule over all things at once as a prince of God. For you have received nothing for your own and are nothing to all things. And all things are as nothing to you. You are as a child which understands not what a thing is. And though you do perhaps understand it, Yet you understand it without mixing with it and without sensibly affecting or touching your perception. Even in that manner wherein God does rule and see all things. God comprehending all and yet nothing comprehending God. Ah, how shall I arrive at this heavenly understanding, at this sight of all things in God, at this pure and naked knowledge which is abstracted from the senses, at this light above nature and creature, and at this participation of the divine will which oversees all things, and governs through all intellectual beings. For alas, I am touched every moment by the things which are about me, and overshadowed by the clouds and fumes which rise up out of the earth. I desire therefore to be taught, if possible, how I may attain such a state and condition, that no creature may be able to touch me, to hurt me, and how my mind, being purged from sensible objects and things, may be prepared for the entrance and habitation of the divine wisdom in me.
You desire that I would teach you how you are to attain it. And I will direct you to our master, from whom I have been taught it, that you may learn it yourself from him, who alone teaches the heart. Hear him. Would you to arrive at this, to remain untouched by the sensory, would you behold light in the very light of God and see all things thereby? Then consider the words of Christ. Who is that light? And who is the truth? Consider now his words. Without me, you can do nothing. And do not hesitate to apply yourself unto him, who is the strength of your salvation and the power of your life, and with whom you can do all things by the faith which Christ works in you. But unless you wholly give yourself up to the life of Jesus Christ and surrender your will wholly, and desire nothing without him. You shall never come to that rest that no creature can disturb. Think what you please and delight in the activity of your own reason, but you shall find that in your own power and without such a total surrender you can never arrive at such a rest as this. Or the true quiet of the soul, wherein no creature can molest you or so much as touch you, which when you shall by grace have attained to, then with your body you are in the world, as in the properties of outward nature, and with your reason, but with your will you walk in heaven, and are at the end from whence all creatures are proceeded forth, and to which they return again. And then you can, in this end, which is the same with the beginning, behold all things outwardly with the reason and inwardly with the mind. And so may you rule in all things and over all things with Christ unto whom all power is given, both in heaven and on earth. O oh Master, the creatures which live in me do withhold me, so that I cannot so wholly yield and give up myself as I willingly would. What am I to do in this case? Do not let this trouble you. Does your will go forth from the creatures? then the creatures are forsaken in you. They are in the world, and your body, which is in the world, is with creatures. But spiritually, you walk with God and converse in heaven, being in your mind redeemed from earth. 
and separated from creatures to live the life of God. And if your will thus leaves the creatures and goes forth from them, even as the spirit goes forth from the body at death, then are the creatures dead in it and live only in the body in the world. Since if your will does not bring itself into them, they cannot bring themselves into it. Neither can they by any means touch the soul. And hence St. Paul says, Our conversation is in heaven. And also, you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. So then the true ones are the very temples of the Holy Ghost who dwells in them. That is, the Holy Ghost dwells in the will and the creature dwells in the body. Blessed is the one who arrives to such a state of this. But alas, poor creature that I am, how is this possible as to me? And what, Master, would become of me if I should never attain with my mind to that where no creature is? Must I not cry out, I am undone. Why are you so dispirited? Be of good heart still, for you may certainly yet attain to it. Only believe, and all things are made possible to you. If it were that your will O oh, you of little courage, could break off itself for one hour, or even but for one half an hour, from all creatures, and plunge itself into that where no creature is, or can be. Presently it would be penetrated and clothed upon with the greatest radiance of the glory of God. Would taste in itself the most sweet love of Jesus, the sweetness whereof no tongue can express, and would find in itself the unspeakable words of our Lord, concerning the great mercy. But how would a person's body be maintained in the world? Or how would one be able to maintain those that are theirs? If by such a realisation and communion one incurs the displeasure of all the world. 
such a person gets greater favours than the world are able to bestow upon them. They have God for their friend. They have all the angels for their friends. In all dangers and necessities, these protect and relieve them, so that they need not fear any manner of evil. No creature can hurt them. God is their helper, and that is sufficient. Also God, in each blessing, in everything, and though sometimes it may seem as if God would not bless them, yet is this but for a trial to them and for the attraction of the divine love. To the end they may more fervently pray to God and commit all their ways unto God. O Master, nevertheless it is very grievous to be generally despised of the world and to be trampled upon by humans. That which now seems so hard and heavy to you, you will yet hereafter be most of all in love with. Loving Master, I am well content that this love should rule in me over the natural life, so that I may attain to that which is supernatural and supersensual. But pray tell me now, why must love and hatred, friend and foe, thus be together? Would not love alone be better? Wherefore I say, a love and trouble thus joined? If love dwelt not in trouble, it could have nothing to love, but its substance which it loves, namely the poor soul, being in trouble and pain. It has thence cause to love this, its own substance, and to deliver it from pain. So that itself may be by it, again, beloved. Neither could anyone know what love is if there were no hatred or what friendship is if there were no foe to contend with. Or in one word, if love had not something which it might love and manifest the virtue and power of love by working our deliverance to the Beloved from all pain and trouble. Master, pray, what is the virtue, the power, the height, and the greatness of love. The virtue of love is nothing and all. All that nothing visible out of which all things proceed. Its power is through all things. 
Its height is as high as God. Its greatness is as great as God. Its virtue is the principle of all principles. Its power supports the heavens and upholds the earth. Its height is higher than the highest heavens. And its greatness is even greater than the very manifestation of the Godhead in the glorious light of the divine essence. As being infinitely capable of greater and greater manifestations in all eternity. What more can I say? Love is higher than the highest. Love is greater than the greatest. Yea, it is in a certain sense greater than God, while yet in the highest sense of all, God is love, and love is God. Love being the highest principle is the virtue of all virtues from whence they flow forth. Love being the greatest majesty is the power of all powers from whence they severally operate. And it is the holy magical root or ghostly power from whence all the wonders of God have been wrought by the hands of God's elect servants in all their generations successively. Whoever finds it finds nothing and all things. Dear Master, pray tell me how I may understand this. First, then, in that I said its virtue is nothing, or that nothing, which is the beginning of all things, you must understand it thus. When you are gone forth wholly from the creature and from that which is visible and are become nothing to all that is nature and creature, then you are in that eternal one, which is God itself. And then you shall perceive and feel in your interior, the highest virtue of love. But in that I said, its power is through all things. This is that which you perceive and find in your own soul and body experientially whenever this great love is enkindled within you, seeing that it will burn more than fire can do, as it did in the prophets of old, and afterwards in the apostles, when God conversed with them bodily, 
and when God's Spirit descended upon them in the Oratory of Zion. You shall then see also, in all the works of God, how love has poured forth itself into all things, inwardly in the virtue and power of everything, and outwardly in the figure and form thereof. And in that I said, its height is as high as God. You may understand this in yourself. For as much as it brings you to be as high as God itself is, by being united to God, as may be seen by our beloved Lord Christ in our humanity, which humanity love has brought up into the highest throne above all angelical principalities and powers into the very power of the deity itself. But in that I also said, its greatness is as great as God, you are hereby to understand that there is a certain greatness and latitude of heart in love which is inexpressible. For it enlarges a soul as wide as the whole creation of God. And this shall be truly experienced by you beyond all words when the throne of love shall be set up in your heart. Lastly, where I also said, whosoever finds it, finds nothing and all things. That is also certain and true. But how does one find nothing? I will tell you how. One that finds it, finds a supernatural, supersensual abyss, which has no ground or abyss to stand on, and where there is no place to dwell in. And they also find nothing that is like unto it. And therefore, it may fitly be compared to nothing. For it is deeper than anything, and is as nothing with respect to all things. For as much as it is not comprehensible by any of them, And because it is nothing, respectively, it is therefore free from all things, and is that only good which a person cannot express or utter what it is, there being nothing to which it may be compared 
to express it by. But in that I lastly said, whosoever finds it, finds all things. There is nothing can be more true than this assertion. It has been the beginning of all things, and it rules all things. It is also the end of all things and will thence comprehend all things within its circle. All things are from it, and in it, and by it. If you find it, you come into that ground from whence all things are proceeded and wherein they subsist, and you are in it, a king or a queen, over all the works of God. If you do remember well what I have answered you, you shall soon come thereby to understand that hidden mystical wisdom of God, which none of the wise persons of the world know, and where the truth thereof is to be found in you, shall be given you from above to discern. Be silent, therefore, in your spirit, and watch unto prayer. For in the love of Christ your mind may be disposed for finding that noble pearl, which to the world appears nothing but which to the children of wisdom is all things. <laughs>